All right, good morning. morning. You guys thought you were the only ones that had trouble with technology. Turns out all of us do. Um, So if you arrived a little bit late, that's okay, uh, because we got started a little bit late. So that means I'll try to, I'll try to be a little bit shorter. It probably won't happen, uh, but, you know, uh, I'll try. Hey, that video um, is an initiative called the 938 Project, Project 938, Uh, And it also corresponds with a special Sunday, which is next Sunday, the first Sunday in October. Uh, Churches from all over the United States and all over the world are coming together to pray, specifically uh, from Matthew 9.38, where Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out workers or laborers into the harvest. And and so as a church, we are going to participate and be a part of this Project 938. The guy on the video, his name is John Connerup. He is the missions director of the Baptist Bible Fellowship International. That is the network of churches that, that our church is a part of. And most of the missionaries that we support all over the world are part of the Baptist Bible Fellowship. And, and so churches who are a part of this network and missionary churches uh, from Africa and Asia and Europe and everywhere in between uh, are gathering together on this special Sunday, the first Sunday in October. Now, why the first Sunday in October? Because 938, there is no, there is no September 38th, right? Um, and so uh, we pick the best next closest, which would be the first Sunday in October. Uh, and so we're going to gather as churches and pray. And so we'll have a special time of prayer in our service next Sunday morning, but we're also going to have a special prayer service next Sunday evening. It's been a while since we've had our first Sunday prayer gathering on a Sunday night with our renovations and everything else going on this summer. Uh, But man, I am really excited to gather together as a church family next Sunday night at six o'clock. We're going to gather in the Alive room right back here, our youth room, uh, to to pray together uh, for our church and for churches all over the world that God would raise up people who would go and take the gospel. So that's 938 Sunday. You can set a little reminder on your phone. I've got a reminder on my phone, but set your alarm for 938 and just begin to pray. What's, what's really cool is there's only one time in scripture where Jesus asked us to pray for something, and that was this. He said, I'm going to ask you to pray that the Father would send laborers into the harvest. So we're going to be a part of that with churches from all over the world I'm praying that God would raise up more workers. So thank you for uh, participating in that. So next Sunday night, our, our, we'll have our prayer gathering. Let me give you a quick update on the renovations. Um, they are moving, uh, and we have half of the room is done with carpet this week. We still have some other flooring, some stuff we're doing on the stage. And uh, the biggest holdup for us is we're waiting on chairs, which are still in China. Um, And so, as you've probably seen on the news, uh, shipping is messed up all over the world, um, and and they were supposed to be here in July and then August, and and it just, on and on it goes. Got an email this week that said, for sure, they're getting on a boat this week. Now, some some of you have seen in, in California, the ports in LA are like totally backed up. They're not coming to California, so that's good. They're coming around and up to Charleston, uh, and, and so that's where they'll be offloaded and then sent here. So it's going to be a while before the chairs get here. So we are looking at options uh, because the building will be done. Everything, all the work will be done before the chairs get here. So we're, we're trying to figure out ways that we can gather in there. Um, you know, we could just put folding chairs out, I suppose, but that would kind of be anticlimactic. So we're trying to figure out the best way to gather. Um, and so thank you for being here and gathering with us this morning. For those of you who are joining us online, thank you for gathering with us. But hey, really be praying um, that, that all of that would continue to, to move and go smoothly. God provided incredibly financially through you, church, uh, to, to allow us to accomplish all that work. Um, and so we're in the, we're in the home stretch. Uh, just pray we don't pass out before we get there, okay? We're literally on the proverbial slow boat from China, so. Well, hey, we are continuing our series this morning, Why? Answering some of the big questions that that are underneath all of the rest of our questions. And last week, uh, we established that that we have to have a source of truth, right? If we're going to answer 
questions, we have to have a source from which we get those answers. Otherwise, your answer is just as good as my answer is just as good as the guy next door's answer. And we're all answering it from different perspective and experience. And, and, and the truth is we recognize that that's never really going to get us anywhere. We have to have a source of truth that is, that is established we said that is objective. That is an object outside of ourselves. It's the object of truth. And so we looked at uh, a passage of scripture out of the book of John, and it's going to be here on the screen. In John chapter 18, Jesus is speaking to Pilate, and he says, you say that I'm king, Jesus replied. I was born for this and have come into the world for this to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate responds to him by saying, what is truth? And and we looked at the reality that we live in a culture that that says, yeah, what is truth? Can you really know what truth is? And so um, we tried to establish last week that that we do have a source of truth. And that comes through Jesus Christ and and his word. And, And we tried to establish that the the Bible is credible and reliable. And if you missed last week's sermon, uh, you can check it out on our website or through our app. But Jesus says that he came into the world to testify to truth. And then he also says, those who are of the truth will listen to his voice. And if we want to be people of truth, if we want to be people who want to know and seek out truth, then, then we'll listen to his voice. So this morning, we're going to look at another question, and that's this. Why should I trust God? If there is a God, why should I trust him? And, and underneath that, maybe the question is, why is there evil in the world? Why would a good God allow evil in the world? If there is a God who allows evil, why should I trust him? Because we kind of have this assumption, right? That this is the question under the question. We say, if there's a God who allows evil because he is not able to restrain evil, then he's not really all powerful and and not worthy of our worship. And the flip side is if we have a God who who could restrain evil and yet doesn't, then to our way of thinking, he, he couldn't be good, so why would we worship him? And so many people, this is, this is the struggle. This is the, the thing that, that causes people to walk away from faith. It's not so much I don't believe in God. It's I can't reconcile the pain and the suffering and the evil of this world with a good and loving God. So we're going to look at this question today, and we're going to go pretty quick. Um, but let me pray before we get into it, okay? Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. And in your love, you made a way for us to know truth. And in your love, you made a way for us to endure hardship and suffering. And in your love, you ultimately have dealt with evil once and for all through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And so this morning, as we look at your word, uh, as we saw last week, you have given us your spirit, who is the spirit of truth, who can guide us into all truth. And so this morning, guide us by your spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear and and hearts to obey. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so why should I trust God? If there is evil in the world, how can I trust a God who allows evil in the world? And so we've got we've to take a couple steps back. And the first step back we need to take is, is to identify what is evil, right? How do we get our definition of evil? If we say there is evil in the world, there are bad things in the world, how is it that we define those things as evil or bad? There has to be an objective source of truth, as we talked about last week, or an objective source of right, wrong, morality, good. In order for us to say that's bad, there has to be an objective good, right? That makes sense. And so the question of of how can there be a good God if there's evil in the world presupposes or points to the reality that there is a God. To ask that question means uh, we have an idea of what is right and what is wrong, and, and I believe we only have that if there is an objective source of truth and good. 
Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a letter called uh, The Letters from the Birmingham Jail. He wrote it to pastors in the United States, and he says this. He says, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God, and an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Again, it points to this idea that there is an ultimate morality, that there is an ultimate good, that there is an ultimate truth. And we say that's good and that's bad based on this objective truth or reality. And so in order to answer the question of evil and suffering, first we have to, we have to admit that there is an objective source of good. There is an objective source of truth. Without that, then we're just making up what's good or what's bad. But we don't believe that. We believe that there is an evil and there is a good. And so First, we have to identify what is evil. And, and so that evil is, is anything that is outside of God's ultimate truth or, or outside of his ultimate goodness. Next week, we're going to look at the reality of sin. And none of us like to talk about sin, but we're going we're gonna to do it next week, so that'll be fun. Um, But today, uh, we're we're not going to spend a lot of time there, except to say that if we want to identify evil, we have to identify truth. Only the existence of God gives us the moral basis for identifying evil and suffering. This question itself points to the existence of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 15 says this, They, that is humanity, show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either accuse them or excuse them. There is this moral law in the universe that comes from God, and and our hearts prove it because we go, that guy's bad. He cut me off. That that guy is evil. it's, It's based on this ultimate moral law. It's not arbitrary. We also know when we do things that are not good, right? We feel guilty about those things. We, we know when we, when we said that guy just cut me off and then we cut somebody else off and they honk at us, we go, oh, well, eventually we feel bad. First, we say bad things to them. Um, but right, we, we know this. Our, our hearts testify to the truth that there is an ultimate good, an ultimate reality, an ultimate truth. Scripture also tells us In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says, Because they, that is humanity, did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God's ultimate truth, God delivered them or released them over to a corrupt mind so that they do what is not right. The truth is that we want to do bad things. uh, Some of you may remember there's a video of a little kid. He was seven years old and stole his grandma's car. Does anybody remember this and drove through town? And the, the, uh, he was being interviewed by, by the reporter and, um, and they said, why did you do that? And he said, because it's fun to do bad stuff. <laughs> that was his answer. And hey, sometimes it's fun to do bad stuff, right? We've all experienced that reality. Because of that, God said, okay, Go for it. Now, if there is evil, that's, that, we can only determine that based on an objective good or an objective truth. And if there is evil, we also must admit that sometimes we're evil too. Right? We, we like to measure evil. We say, well, there's Hitler over here and then there's me. I'm, I'm not that bad. I just, you know, I, I, I don't do everything right, but I'm pretty good. But, Let's be honest, we all have a little bit of evil in us. We've thought things before that we go, man, I, whew, where'd that come from? We've said things before. We've done things before that, that we know are not right. In fact, we say this is wrong for other people to do, and yet we do that same thing as Scripture says. Our consciences convict us. There is evil, and that evil resides in all of us. And, and we can debate you know, which is more evil, but, but there is evil. It's a deviation from the object of truth, and that evil resides in us. And so the question is, if there is a good God, why would he allow evil? And so the question is, what should he do about it? If it's in you, and it's in me, and it's in all humanity, 
What should he do about it? Well, there's two options. He could just restrain it and make us all do whatever he wants and, you know, th then we would be robots. And no, nobody likes that. So how, and, and we get into these deep questions about the free will of man and the sovereignty of God. And, and if you want to have a long conversation about that sometime, email me, Pastor Dustin, at orlandobaptist.com, and we'll do it. But for now, let's just all admit that that the idea of a God who just forces us to be kind of robots that only do the right thing, um, nobody wants that. The other option is, is that he would punish evil. And I believe that he will punish evil. Scripture's really clear about that. That one day God will make every wrong right and we will all stand before him to be judged for the evil that is in our heart. So there's evil, which is kind of human caused, right? People do bad things. But then there's also suffering, which is not human caused. We would say maybe things like cancer or things like earthquakes or hurricanes or natural disasters. We would say, yeah, but nobody did that. God, God did that. God allowed that. Why would God allow a tsunami to kill thousands of people? Why, why would God allow a, a little child to get leukemia and die. I, I'm going to do a funeral next Saturday for a three-year-old. That's hard. Why would God allow that? It wasn't a choice that that three-year-old made. He didn't, you know, he didn't do anything. This idea about natural disasters and natural phenomena that, that lead to human suffering, it, it, it causes us to question, but, but we have to, again, go to the source of truth. If we're going to answer uh, the question about evil, we have to go to the source from which we define evil. Romans chapter 8, verse 20 says this, the creation, that is the created world, was subjected to futility. Futility means keep doing the same thing and keep getting the same result, right? It, it never quite goes the way it's supposed to. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. Scripture teaches that the natural world is affected by the evil that resides in you and in me. The creation is not immune from the consequences of the evil that resides in me and in you and in all of humanity. It's affected by it. And, it, and the scripture says, not willingly, right? The creation didn't mess up, but, but it is still subjected to futility the same way that you and I are. You're dying right now. <laughs> You're in the process of dying. You have one, two, three, four, five less seconds for your life right now than you did before I started counting. It's just the reality because we live in a world that is in decay. The second law of thermodynamics says everything is in a state of decay. Things don't get better, they get worse. That's the state of the world that we live in and it's part of the consequence of the evil that resides in you and in me. Evil, that's a bad word, <laughs> but it's a real word. And so even the, the suffering that seems to be from natural causes, sickness and pain and death and chronic illness and all of these things are a result of this sin, this evil. It has consequences. Humanity and creation are tied together in this. So why wouldn't God restrain the natural things of this world that cause suffering? Well, it, it's, it's part of it's part of the ultimate judgment that, that will happen one day. But also, we don't know that God is not restraining evil. 2 Thessalonians 2.7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. Scripture teaches that God does restrain some evil in the world. Now, clearly there is evil in the world. There's really bad stuff that happens. And now we've got access to YouTube videos and all of these things that are happening all over the world, and it's heartbreaking for sure. 
But scripture seems to teach that, that God is still restraining some evil. What could it look like if God totally took his hands off? Now, you might say, well, that's no comfort to me because I still lost a loved one to sickness or I, I still lost my house to a flood or I still suffered from some natural disaster. Why does God allow it? Well, again, it's part of the consequences of sin in the world. And so either God will restrain evil and suffering or, or the other option is that he would punish evil and suffering. And scripture says that he will absolutely do that. So we have to say, well, well how and when will he do that? How will he punish evil and suffering? Well, there, there will be a punishment and there will be a restoration, scripture says. God will punish and, and banish evil. Scripture says to a place called hell, that's a biblical concept that is literal and real. And, and then he will restore creation. So there will be a, a punishment and a restoration that scripture talks about. But when should he do that? Right? Because if he's going to punish all evil and there's evil inside of all of us, how does he deal with that without just wiping us all out? I, I have a friend who is a pastor and a counselor, um, and he's dealt with some really hard questions in his life. He's counseled people through incredible trauma, through incredible abuse that they suffered through a lifetime, and, and tried to help them uh, connect to the heart of God in the midst of the incredible suffering that they faced. And he was telling me a story about a woman that he counseled who suffered abuse her whole life from a family member as a child. Kind of got through life, and as she got into her middle ages, once her kids were out of the house, all of a sudden it caught up with her. The trauma of that. She spent time with him and, and counseling and going to God's word and, and seeking God's truth. And one day she came to him and said, Pastor, I, I I've really struggled with this and I've, and I've wondered why did God allow this? Why didn't he just kill this guy so he couldn't do this bad stuff to me? She said, and then I felt, I felt like God was telling me because then he would just have to kill all of us. And that's the truth. If there's evil in all of us, and we know there is, and we might say their evil is worse than mine, but how do we even define that without a source of truth and objective reality? then for God to punish that evil, then, then he's got to punish all evil. Scripture says that he will do that, but listen to what Romans chapter three says, starting in verse 23. If you've been in church a while, you've heard this verse. Maybe if you even aren't really a Christian, you've heard people tell you this verse and you don't like it because it says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But listen, it continues. It says, they, these, these sinners, are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The redemption through Christ was his death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. But listen to verse 25. It says, God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood, that is Jesus, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. And this is what's important. Because in his restraint, in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Scripture teaches that God will punish sin, and we're going to see in a minute that he has punished sin already. But in his restraint, he, he's waited to mete out that punishment. In his restraint, he passed over the sins previously committed, that God is patient, that, that, he, is, that he has restrained his judgment and his wrath that is right Right, because we ask this question, why would a good God allow evil in the world? And that, that, that points out the need for justice. It, it points out for the need for God to judge that evil and that suffering. But in his restraint, he, he waited. He, he passed over those sins previously committed. Well, why would he do that? It's for our benefit. 
2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord does not delay his promise to judge and restore, as some understand delay. We say, come on, God, fix it, fix it, fix it. But is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God has restrained his judgment and punishment of evil because on that day when he ultimately judges and punishes evil, it's over. It's over for those who have committed evil. And so he's waited patiently, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And when we ask the question, why would a good God allow evil and suffering? Surely if he's good, he wouldn't allow it. We, we make an assumption that somehow God's just cool with it. Right? The evil and suffering of the world that somehow God is like, eh, yeah, that's, it'll be fine. You know, chin up. Deal with it. But that's not how God feels about evil and suffering. That's why he's going to punish it severely. But if God dealt with it right now, none of us could withstand the judgment. So Romans chapter 3, verse 25, points to this reality. I think I've got it on the screen. It says, God presented him, that's Jesus Christ, as the mercy seat. The mercy seat is, is a picture back to the Old Testament. The mercy seat is the place where uh, the sacrificial blood of an animal was placed to pay for the sins of the nation of Israel, God's people. It was pointing to something that would be better, the book of Hebrews tells us, a better sacrifice. But God presented him, Jesus Christ, as the mercy seat by his blood. God has punished evil through the death of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to really be honest about this question, why would a good God allow evil and suffering? We, we have to see two things. One, ultimately he will judge evil and has judged evil. He hasn't just let it go. He has dealt with it and he will de deal with it finally on the final day of judgment. But he has punished evil through the death of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, another familiar passage of Scripture. But I want you to listen to everything that, that is said in this Isaiah 53 passage. Because it, it points to this comprehensive judgment and restoration that comes through Jesus Christ. That says, he, this is talking about Jesus, by the way, written 700 years before Jesus' birth. He, Jesus Christ, was despised and rejected by men. He was a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He experienced sickness. He was like someone people turned away from. He, he experienced the suffering of rejection. He was despised. We didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. He, had, he experienced sickness, but he also experienced my sickness and your sickness. He carried our pains, that pain of rejection and loss. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, our evil, the evil that resides in you and me because he was crushed because of our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was upon him and we are healed by his wounds. God does not leave evil unchecked. He does not leave evil unaccounted for. He has dealt with evil. God through the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, carried the full weight and pain and shame of sin, the full consequences of sin, even the consequences of the futility of creation has been carried by Jesus Christ on the cross. And God in his restraint is waiting for us to turn to Jesus Christ who is the source 
of hope and restoration. The one who paid the judgment of evil so that we wouldn't have to pay it. He's waiting for us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God has punished evil through the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just die like you and I would die. He he died for sure a a humiliating, painful death, the death of the cross. It's, It's humiliating. You're on public display. It's incredibly painful. But it wasn't just a human death that he died. It was a human death that he died, but it was also a a, a spiritual wrath of God that was poured out on him. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken or turned away from me? He carried the full weight and wrath of all of the evil of the world. All of the things we look at and say, God, why would you allow this? Jesus carried the weight of those things on himself. God has punished evil through the death of Jesus Christ. He hasn't left evil unchecked. And he's waiting for us to respond. I want to read Hebrews, a little bit of Hebrews 11 and the first couple of verses of Hebrews chapter 12 to kind of pull all these thoughts together. And look, you may have a lot of questions, and again, I would love to sit and talk. Um, what I want you to know is that we don't have a God who is aloof to our suffering. In fact, he, he took on our suffering. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 35, it says, people were tortured, not accepting release. This is talking about followers of Jesus who were persecuted and killed for their faith, and and saints of the Old Testament prophets and teachers, so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they died by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. That's suffering. They they experienced the evil persecution of humanity. All of these, these people who endured all of this, were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better, For us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Real quick, I I want us to see this that only through God does suffering have purpose. Only through God does suffering have purpose. If there is no God, suffering is meaningless. I spent a lot of time watching kind of debates and, and, and uh, conversations be- between people who, who deny the existence of God, who, who solve everything with a naturalistic, humanistic explanation. And, and ultimately, pain and suffering has no meaning if there is no God. We're just like atoms <laughs> bumping around in the universe. But our spirit testifies that that's not true. Only through God does our suffering have purpose. That's why verse 39 says, these were approved by their faith, but they didn't receive what was promised since God had provided something better. Something better. The evil and suffering of this world is not final and ultimate. There is an eternity. There is something better. Revelation 21 makes it really clear that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Old things will pass away. There will be no more sickness and no more tears and no more dying. But only through God does suffering of this life have ultimate purpose. Some of you may have heard of Christopher Hitchens. He was a well-known atheist and provocateur uh, of of people of faith. He He wrote a lot of books. He died in 2011. Think of esophageal cancer. 
And even in his death, he said, I, I wish there was purpose in my death. It would make it a lot easier. But ultimately, I have made up my mind about belief. Only through God, through objective reality, Jesus Christ, truth personified, is there meaning to our suffering. Then Hebrews 12 continues, so God provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Goes to chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have also such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with race, run with endurance the race that lies before us. Only through God does suffering have a purpose and only through God do we have a way to endure that suffering. Um, you help me. The family of God, the body of Christ, the church, we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. We bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We walk with each other through suffering. We remind each other of the hope and the promises. God has provided a way for us to endure suffering through his church, through his spirit, who strengthens us and sustains us and through his word that is full of precious promises that we can hold on to. Without that, Again, we just make up meaning. God has given us purpose in our suffering. He's, he's given us a way to endure suffering. Hebrews 12, 2 says, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God suffered for us so that our suffering would not be final. God suffered for us so that our suffering would not be final. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the one who, who initiated. That's what a pioneer is. Pioneer is also somebody who goes into faraway places to establish something. And Jesus left the glory of heaven to come to earth to establish a new people, the people of God. He's also the one who, who perfects, finishes our faith. And it says, because of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. For him, there was joy in the cross. And that joy was you and me, ultimately. The church. We were the joy that lay before him. We were the thing that, that came out of his death, burial and resurrection. And now he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. But Jesus Christ suffered for us so that our suffering would not be final. So why would a good God allow evil and suffering in the world? Well, ultimately, God will remedy evil and suffering. And we don't understand God's timing, but I can tell you Scripture says that Part of the reason he delays is so that you have a chance to respond to his salvation. And in the meantime, while we endure suffering and while we see evil all around us, we can still have hope. But that only comes through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Without him, there, there isn't hope that my suffering or your suffering means anything. So this morning, this question, it's a 
It's a real and reasonable question. The good news is God is happy for you to ask it. The book of Psalms is full of questions like this. God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you forgotten me? God, why have you turned your back on me? God's not afraid of our questions. But if we will sincerely ask the questions, and if we will listen, we will hear God say, One day, I will make every wrong right. And one day, you will see as I see. But until then, you behold in a mirror darkly. And so, ultimately, we have to trust. We have to trust. So this morning, I know there are people in here who have suffered suffered loss, suffered sickness and pain. And some of them would tell you this morning, I don't know how I would do it without Jesus. I don't know how I would do it without him. And that's true. And we have a choice. We can... We can deny the existence of the one who revealed to us the difference between right and wrong. And we could say, because I see that there's wrong in the world, the one who, who defined right from wrong must not exist. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And the truth is, that's not where we go usually. Usually we say there's, there's wrong in the world I know there's a God, but I don't like him because I have suffered. And I don't see any conceivable reason why I should suffer. And if you had all the answers, that would be a good response. But you don't. And I don't say that to be glib or dismissive. I say that to point to a God who has all the answers. So let's pray. God, we love you. God, we struggle to understand the evil and suffering of this world. And God, I believe that by that very struggle, it points to the reality that you are real and that you are good and that you will ultimately remedy the evil and suffering of this world. And so God, I pray that you would help us not to allow that reality to, to pull us away from you, but that that reality would cause us to draw close to you. The only hope that we have for overcoming that evil and suffering. And God, we don't understand your timing so many times. So God, give us assurance through your spirit and through your people and through your word. God, remind us that we don't suffer alone, that Jesus Christ suffered everything that we will ever suffer. God, remind us that this is not the end. That there is an eternity. So Lord, for those who are seriously asking questions this morning, I pray even in this moment that you would, through your spirit, draw them to the truth of your word. For those believers who are struggling this morning, I pray that you would remind them of the hope of eternity and glory. For all of us, God, that we would trust that you are good. 
that your faithful love endures forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. If you keep your heads bowed and eyes closed for just a minute, I, I, I want to pray for you. I want to ask you a couple questions so I know how to pray for you. First, I, I want to ask, is there anybody this morning who would say, I've suffered, I have questions about suffering and evil that's happened in my life. And I, I just want you to pray for me that, that God would help me to to endure those things and see him in those things. Anybody like that that would just say, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with some pain and hurt in my life. Yeah, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. <laughs> God, I pray right now. <laughs> mm. God, I pray that you would assure these who raised their hand this morning that you are not far off, but you are very, very, very near. God, even right now, I pray that your presence will be real and meaningful. In Jesus' name. Let me ask this. Is there anybody who, who would say, um, I, I talked this morning about God's restraint, waiting for those who would to come to repentance before he would ultimately and finally judge sin and Maybe there will be someone this morning who would say, I've never come to that point of, of faith and repentance where I've called on God to, to save me or I've put my faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. But today I, I would like to know more or I, I would like to repent and follow Jesus or I would like to talk to somebody about what that means. If there's anybody like that this morning that would just raise your hand and say, that's me. Let me pray for you this morning. Anybody at all? Praise God. So, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that the darkness has not overcome you. We thank you that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not sickness or death, or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword and all these things. God, we are more than conquerors. So we thank you for that truth. Lord, as we go this week, encourage us, strengthen us, remind us that you are good. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, hey, thank you, church. I'm going to be in the back as we're dismissed this morning. If anybody wants to talk or, or follow up, I'd love to pray with you. If you want somebody to pray with you this morning, I'm available. Uh, but before we go, I want you to check out a video. We're going to get to have our fall festival. It's been a couple of years since we've had it. But it's coming up, then Sarah Har is going to give you some instructions as we close this morning. Love you, church.